Okay, if everyone can, that can stand up and we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance in a moment of silence, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We have no awards or proclamations today, so we will go ahead and go into citizens' forums. If anyone would like to come up to the commission and talk about anything that's not on today's agenda, now is your chance to do so. I'm Joan Ratzleff. I'm a citizen of Salina. And um, I just want to bring up the topic of changing the meeting time. I'm able to be here today because uh, my work schedule is different on a holiday week. Otherwise, I couldn't make it. And um, not that I want to be in your place, but if I were to want to be there, I couldn't do that because my job would prevent me from meeting at 4 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tracy Sin. Um, I'm at three four zero and a half South Connecticut. Um, she goes. I'm here for. Anyway, um, I've lost it. <laughs> is there anybody else I'd like to come up? Seeing nobody else coming up, we have no public hearings or items scheduled for a certain time. We'll go ahead with the consent agenda. Item 6.1, approve the minutes of November 18, 2013. Is there anything a commissioner would like to take out of the consent agenda <coughs> or amend? I do have a question about the minutes. On um, item 13-0390, when we uh, went into executive <coughs> session, um, I wonder, I'm wondering if we need to change our procedure somewhat because it says that we will re reconvene at 6.15 uh, we recessed at 5.30, and, um, and then we reconvened at 7.15. There was no formal action to um, come out of executive session and to go back into executive session for that length of time, or at least it was not um, noted. noted in the minutes. And I was wondering if there, do we need to do something differently to, so that the uh, minutes reflect what we're actually doing, or how does that happen? Mr. Bingston. <laughs> well, that's uh, it's just a matter of how that situation is handled, I suppose. I'm sorry. The, uh, I don't recall the circumstances precisely in that situation, but it uh, uh, certainly any time the time expires and um, you need additional time that uh, that is to be noted so or action taken along that line or maybe what needs to happen is rather than just sticking a head out the door and note that noting that there's no one present that we take some sort of formal action to start the process again for uh, executive session that would be fine if that's your preference yes is there any amendment to the minutes then or? <coughs> I don't think so. I'm just thinking down the road okay. uh, so that they would more accurately reflect what's going on. I move to approve the minutes. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda as presented. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Consent agenda is approved. We'll move on to administration. Item 7.1, second reading ordinance number 13, 10,725. <coughs> Vacating a portion of a plotted utility easement occupying the north 35 feet of lot 16, block 1 of the replot of the Pheasant Ridge edition. Okay. Ordinance number 13 10725 was passed on first reading on November 18, 2013. Since that time, no comments have been received. 
could go ahead and do a I move we approve ordinance number 13-10724 on second reading. Uh, two five, is it? Did you say two five? I'm sorry. Sound like two four? Well, the blue sheet says two four. Oh, my, sorry. Mine's that would I'm be sorry. Item number two. I'm sorry. On second reading, it is uh, 107 two, 13-10725. Thank you. Uh, second. I have a motion and a second. Can I get a roll call, Madam Clerk? Commissioner Blanchard? Aye. Commissioner Crawford? Aye. Commissioner Hardy? Aye. Commissioner Householder? Aye. Mayor Shirley? Aye. That motion passes 5-0. Item 7.2, second reading ordinance number 13, 10,724, levying sign of business improvement district number one service fees for 2014. Ordinance number 13-10724 was passed on first reading on November 18th, 2013. Since that time, no comments have been received. I would entertain a motion on this ordinance. Madam Mayor, I move that we adopt on second reading ordinance number 13-10724. Second. I have a motion and a second. Can I get a roll call, Madam Clerk? Commissioner Blanchard? Aye. Commissioner Crawford? Aye. Commissioner Hardy? Aye. Commissioner Householder? Aye. Mayor Shirley? Aye. That motion carries 5-0. Item 7.3, award of contract for the replacement of a chilled water piping at the Police Department Administrative Building, project number 13302. Mr. Lawson. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, the item before you today for your consideration is the replacement of the chilled water piping at the Police Department Administrative Building. Through uh, our review process, we had noted that the piping was rusting, uh, the joints were becoming um, troublesome, a lot of repair work was being done. And uh, as such, we put it into the CIP for uh, replacement this year. It was approved as a part of that. And we went out for bid. The new piping that we went out for bid for is a poly piping. To, uh, it's very rust averse. It uh, should last for the life of the building. We <clears throat> did a lot of research and believe that it would be a great fit for it. It also would re replace some of the pumps and motors that are part of, uh, part of the system. As such, um, we went out and solicited bids. We only got one bid back. Uh, the bid was from American Commercial and Residential Services, LLC, out of Wichita for $17,109. Our estimate was right at $20,000. We contacted the other bidders to, or some potential other bidders to determine why they didn't, and some of the, uh, <coughs> some of the feedback that we received was from one of the larger companies. Uh, they didn't feel like they needed to, wanted to make a site trip for the amounts that the contract was for or would be for. Uh, we had one who determined that their they were not well suited to weld the poly pipe and to make the connections with it. And then we had one who forgot. So of the three we contacted, that's the different versions that we had heard. As such, we went ahead and brought this before you for consideration. Um, staff does recommend awarding this to um, American Commercial and Residential Services. We did some background work on them. We followed up to make sure that uh, some of the reviews and some of the past work they had done fit and was good. We received good feedback from them. Uh, certainly, you're welcome to reject, and we can rebid the project at a later date or time, or we're open for other options or suggestions you might have. And <coughs> with that, I would open up for questions. <coughs> Any questions for staff? Yeah, just on the, on the one bid, I think that everybody's pretty uncomfortable with the one bid. However, it is substantially under the uh, estimated price. And then also, I think that uh, I appreciate you reaching out to the bidders and finding out exactly why, and it sounds... Uh, reasonable. Uh, what w what would be the implication of of uh, rebidding it if that were taken? If I don't I don't think there's any real implication. I certainly don't want to promise that we would come back with more bids, but from a timing aspect or anything like that, I think we're fine. Time wise, uh, we're not forced to to do it at this point. Um, <coughs> I, would say, I would have a problem doing that because I feel like the bids were put out there. Uh, these guys stepped up to the plate, uh, made the bid, and I don't think we should punish them because in the future they may decide that bidding in Salina isn't to, to their advantage if we're just going to look at their bid and discard it because some other people were too busy or didn't want to bid the bid the process. I think it's important that we that we go along with this this bid. I, I agree with Commissioner Blanchard. I'd like to see more bids, but this was a fair bid. It was opened up. They bid it. It came in under estimate. Probably I agree, okay. and it came in under the engineer's estimate, so I'm okay with it. I. I'm a proponent of multiple bids as well, but I'm g taking it from a little different angle here, and that is that a $17,000 bid um, to me is, for a lot of contractors, not enough money to fool with. And it costs money, especially if you have to drive from Wichita or Kansas City to put the bid together, and at some point you have, you know, 
five or 15 20 percent wrapped up in the bidding process and so uh, the size of this bid I would um, anticipate might only have one bidder I move we approve resolution number I'm sorry I'm sorry <laughs> that's true sorry any other uh, questions for staff thank you any public comment on this matter I go ahead okay. and entertain a motion I move we approve resolution number 137055 <clears throat> I'll second. I have a, um, I'm sorry. No, yeah. Um, hmm. Project number one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, hmm. Had a hard weekend. <laughs> <laughs> well, I knew that new pub opened, so I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I move we approve um, authorization of. Uh, American Commercial and Residential Services uh, for the bid of 17109 Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Same sign. That motion carries 5-0. On to development business. Item 8.1, resolution number 137055 regarding the City of Salinas development policy for the financing of public improvements. I have a feeling that's why we have such a large, cr large crowd here today. Mr. Schrag. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as by way of background, I think you're aware that the special assessment project process for a, a special assessment finance project includes uh, passage of a resolution of advisability, and that's something that we've done as kind of a matter of, of routine on every project we've done special assessment financing for. and that. And that has been done on the premise that there was sufficient discretion for the City Commission to approve or reject a, a project um, and determining whether it was advisable or it wasn't. On July 8th of this year, uh, there was a project and there was ensuing discussion that really kind of dug into that issue and, and it was noted that Resolution 894066, which is the resolution that sets forth our policy, includes a whereas that says the City of Saline is under no obligation to approve any petitioned improvements nor is relinquishing any authority to initiate improvements by the resolution method. So I think the intention there was to retain discretion, but it was noted that the, the resolution and the policy itself says that the City of Salina will facilitate new development by providing for the installation of public improvements, streets, sidewalks, storm sewers, water lines, sanitary sewers, etc., upon submission of a valid petition and required financial commitment. Um, so at that July 8th discussion, it was noted that the the choice of the word will within the resolution itself made it more of a, of a binding commitment than might have been anticipated and it certainly wasn't as discretionary as it might have first seemed. And so the item that was before you on that date, you went ahead and, and approved the, the special assessments for that project but also implemented a 90-day moratorium which based on that date would uh, have an exp had an expiration date of November 4th of this year. Uh, the week following that, staff made the first of two presentations and study session on special assessment financing. So we had study sessions on July 15th and July 22nd, and the development community was there and, and participated in some of that discussion and, and made a request to have the opportunity to present to you in study session uh, their thoughts and their reaction to uh, either the moratorium or just special assessments in general. A date wasn't set at that time for this, the development community study session. and. Uh, September 23rd of this year, in anticipation of that November 4th expiration date, staff came back to you with uh, the question of extending the moratorium, which you, you did by vote, and you extended it another 60 days to December 5th. So in that intervening time then, on November 18th, the development community presented a study session on uh, special assessments, um, which was last week. So now we find ourselves, um, we've, get, we've completed the development community study session, uh, focusing on City Commission discussion at that study session, I think there are a number of topics and approaches that were raised that represent additional staff research and reporting back to you uh, on those those topics. And we find ourselves between the, the November 18th study session, the de December 5th uh, expiration of the 60-day extension, and probably in need of more work and, and reporting back to you on the part of staff. And so the question before you today is how you wish to address the expiration of the moratorium on December 5th. Um, sta staff has identified multiple options for your consideration. <coughs> 
With respect to a fiscal note, uh, assuming that this is just a temporary measure, staff didn't identify any direct or immediate fiscal impacts related to the decision that, that you might make today. And we identified three options for your consideration. One would be to take no action, which would thereby allow the moratorium to expire. It would result in reverting back to the, the, the existing resolution 894066 and reverting back to uh, the prior practice uh, in terms of application of special assessments, leaving that that will uh, terminology in the resolution and creating the, the expectation that if it meets the, the uh, criteria spelled out for application, then uh, special assessment financing will be granted. The second option that we identified was to approve what we're calling version A of resolution number 137055, which would extend the moratorium once again and preclude the approval of special assessments as we continue to determine uh, an amended approach going forward. And, and I would note that that moratorium applies to residential and commercial um, special assessment financing. I don't know that we have pending applications in either category, but it, it's not exclusively residential. And then the third uh, option that we identified was to approve version B of the resolution 137055, which readopts the entire uh, contents of the original resolution with the exception of replacing the word will with may and striking section 7, which was basically grandfathering language that applied to uh, items that were in process back in 1989 when the resolution was first adopted. And so the, if you took the third approach, it would create discretion on your part to look at any applications you might receive in the interim on a case-by-case -case basis, still prescribes the funding criteria as it relates to water, street, storm, those type of things, uh, but, but does give you probably the maximum flexibility in considering and processing a special assessment financing request in the interim. I say all that, to, but want to be sure to acknowledge that staff recognizes there's probably more homework that, that we need to do in response to your study session last week, and we stand prepared to do that. Um, just won't be able to get that completed by December 5th. Um, one last thing but before you go to public comment. We did receive by email um, some written feedback on the topic from Carl Ryan, uh, Ryan and uh, you should have that at your seat as well. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions um, as you see fit. Any questions for staff? I'll go ahead and start. Uh, Mike, you mentioned that uh, option number two in that when this moratorium on special assessments was put in place, I believe, was, wasn't that for residential only? And I believe that was the intent. <coughs> I, that may very well be. I don't, I'd have to go back and look at the motion, but I believe it was just a moratorium on special assessment financing. Okay. And then as it pertains to uh, number three as well, um, simply changing from will to may, I think does allow flexibility currently there are, however, within the discussions that we've had over the last several months, quite a few other criteria that we feel needs to be addressed. And I might just point out that, that the whole idea behind this thing was to try and get our policies in line with the vision laid out in the comprehensive plan. And I know a lot of people are probably getting tired of me talking about the comprehensive plan, but that is the overriding vision of the community. And a lot of time and money went into putting together that comprehensive plan. We've had people that have argued against a comprehensive plan that voted to enact it. Um, I think that that's rather telling that uh, we have a vision, but we don't want to do the hard work that it takes to implement that. I might point out that uh, one of the critical parts, and, and, and just so you know that I'm not just making this up, I've heard people say that we have our own agenda up here. We don't have our own agenda up here. We have uh, the idea of uh, implementing this plan and doing the duties that we were elected to do is to implement this plan, to look at, see the advisability of it, and implement it. And I will just point out to the implementation matrix and it's in the back. It's the last 41 pages of the comprehensive plan. It's actually part three. The first part of the comprehensive plan is the vision. 
and it contains the vision statement, our vision goal, and some of the things that list the things that we value as a community. The second part is the plan. Uh, goes through a lot of different parts, the community, schools, economic development, new development, land uses, all those things. The third part is the action, and that's what I'm addressing here in the implementation plan. And part of the community part, one of the tasks that's listed as a number one priority is review and amend as needed existing policies, strategies, and tools to facilitate and incentivize infill development. Now I think any time that you're looking at your toolbox and you're trying to determine the best use of your tools and the incentives that you have at, your, uh, have at hand, I think you need to look at all the tools that you have and how you're using them. Uh, I know on my part, the reason for bringing up this whole policy was to say, what are we doing uh, using, uh, how, how are we using these tools to best um, facilitate and implement this comprehensive plan? So um, that's kind of a little statement, but my, my question for staff is, is that al along with that, I, I'd hope that we might be looking at different criteria um, for the advisability. Um, some of those might be what is the overall master plan of a development looks like. Part of the reason there is that I think some of the recent advisability the most recent uh, special assessment advisability had uh, phase three or four of, of a development that we were looking at about nine or ten lots. And it seems like that's kind of a piecemeal approach to, to doing this, so I'd like to see maybe if we can get towards more of an overall look and continu continuity. Uh, the other is that, you know, there has been discussion as to whether uh, new development pays for, for itself or not. There have been arguments on both sides of that spectrum. And I think that we may want to look at requiring some sort of fiscal impact analysis. Um, I think we need to look at other incentives that might um, be more beneficial to new development in the edge, in, in edge areas, and that is looking at different uh, type of quality enhancers that might include uh, cluster development techniques. <coughs> Uh, I think we need to make sure that the roads that are being built are roads that are going to last over time. That means if they have proper sub base, if the proper soil compaction, uh, and so on. But we are accepting these into uh, our long-term maintenance obligations, so I want to make sure that those are uh, properly built to uh, uh, make sure we don't have high costs of, of uh, maintenance and repair in the years going forward. I'd also like to look at possibly taking the 15-year payback period back down where it was originally at 10. And um, those are just a few things. I, so I, I'm not opposed to uh, making, making a change that might reflect something more along the lines of, of a number three, uh, but with the, the intention that, that we look at the overall policy and look deeper into whether or not it's been effective in accomplishing the goals of the implementation of this plan. And I, in response <coughs> to that, uh, staff's intention with number three is that that be an interim approach while we address the remainder of the policy considerations and prepare a final revised, uh, if there is a revision, a final revised policy. Any other questions for staff? I think uh, Commissioner Blanchard uh, has a lot of valid comments that are um, um, that we should consider and uh, seriously. I do think that um, I'm, I'm a little bit conflicted uh, because uh, I know from my uh, discussions with um, in some of the the prior sessions that we've had that a lot of the, the builders in, in Salina are not equipped. Uh, to handle, um, to absorb the cost of all of the infrastructure that's involved in, um, in a new development. I do think, but I do think that our attention needs to be uh, placed on uh, infill and redevelopment. I, I like that idea a lot. I, we ca but we, we cannot, say, disallow new development. And I think that, that can continue to happen. Uh, but like you said, I think maybe there's some more creative way to look at the funding of um, the infrastructure that would benefit both 
the city and the, um, the builder as well. Recognizing this is a broad topic, staff tried to divide the question into kind of the more immediate issue of what do we do with the moratorium that expires on the 5th, and recognizing there's probably more discussion, at least at the city commission level, in terms of the policy. Oh, you gotta come. Thank you, Mr. Schrag. Did you have anything, Jason? Yeah, just for clarification, I, I uh, went back and looked at the uh, motion in the minutes and on the original moratorium and it, it is uh, moved by Commissioner Blanchard, seconded by Commissioner Householder to add to the agenda for consideration a 90-day moratorium on resolution 89-4066 pertaining to the development and then you went on to uh, with that same uh, action or the, the following action to approve a 90-day moratorium on that resolution so the actual action I'm not sure what the intent was but it, it did actually put a moratorium on the entire uh, Resolution and if you look at the resolution, it really doesn't differentiate between residential and commercial So that's probably why that action was like that just for clarification. That's great. Thank, Thank you. you Well, I think we need to uh, I don't think we want to extend I I don't myself want to extend the moratorium. I think it affects jobs I think right now with our economy just trying to to get restarted again we have contractors we have uh, plumbers electricians uh, are, are if are not out of work will be if we continue this moratorium. That's my opinion. Uh, any other questions for staff? <clears throat> okay, no questions for staff. Anybody out in the audience that would like to speak on this matter? Somebody's got to be first. <laughs> I'll be first. <laughs> there you go. Um, Stan Bike was 2601 South Ohio. Um, thank you for your time and, and thank you for all the effort you've put forward. This has been a, quite an ongoing discussion. Um, although I don't speak for the group, I, I'm only speaking for myself at the moment, I would probably recommend at this point in time to go with version B. I think it gives the commission uh, a lot of latitude and it, and it gives the commission <coughs> and city staff uh, the time to really study the, the issues that, that you've brought up. Um, so that's really all I've got to say, unless you have any questions. Thank you, Stan. Thank you. Abner Perney, 101 Overhill. Um, I've had a lot of real estate dealings over the 60 some, well, last 40 some years, uh, but only two properties that had uh, special assessments on them when I bought them. In both cases, uh, the seller never bothered to tell me. And it's, that's one of the, that's kind of the lead into why I don't like special assessments. They're used frequently, but very few people, including the people selling real estate, really understand them. And so what happens is, all too often, the true cost of housing is much more than the buyer expected because we're not really up front with the fact that there may be ten, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars more that to be paid for that property uh, than you expected when you when you saw the sales price. Um, as I said, only one of those involved a uh, realtor registered trademark. The other was a direct private sale. So uh, I want to split the blame there. But at any rate, as far as the issue of how should the city go from now forward, uh, I like the idea of cutting the term back to 10 years if you're going to have special assessments at all that uh, Commissioner Blanchard has, has brought out. Uh, I've also done a lot of uh, buying, selling, trading in Colorado. And in the communities where I've worked in Colorado, there are no special assessments. They just don't do it. Now, of course, their market's different because it's a go-go place to live where people want to live. And so, the, theoretically, they can put all the expenses of a development in the initial price of the house and the developer can finance it themselves through their own resources and through private banking. Uh, that's something we may or may not enjoy. We are allegedly working on trying to make Salina the kind of place people want to live and, and be some kind of a magnet 
for the greater uh, central United States as, as an attractive place to live. Whether you need special assessments to do that or, or not is really questionable. Uh, the other concept that was kind of hinted at, again by uh, Commissioner Blanchard, is to focus geographically where special assessments would be allowed more strictly than we do now. Because right now, it's that we have that broad thing in the, in the uh, overall comprehensive plan that says this is our service area. Well, the service area goes way out farther than is realistic, at least in the shorter term, five to ten years. Uh, it goes out a couple of miles away in some, some areas from the present uh, city limits. So that's another alternative that I think would be worth investigating is to draw a more precise map and say and focus this kind of financing into a specific area where we really want to see some more development, whether it's really infill or whether it's close in to where we've already invested in the utilities and some of the, the streets and maybe other infrastructures. Uh, but I think the overall goal of doing away with them is actually admirable and in the long run would be best for the, the total community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Abner. My name is Eric Campbell, 800 East Doc Holiday Pass. Um, I'm a citizen of the community and have been since the early 90s. I have a business, multi businesses, multiple businesses in this community. I own a Summit Plumbing Company, I own a repair shop called The Garage. My concern, multiple on different levels, one as a citizen, I think that we need new housing to bring people into the community. To be attractive for people to move to this community, we need some new housing. I don't know how much we need, but we need some new housing. And the builders that we have, I work with multiple builders in town, the builders we have are not equipped to take this burden on financially. They will not do it, and no one else will step up to do it. We will become stagnant again. We have done great improvements in the last 10 years. 10 plus years, uh, I think, in growth. I know personally as my business, I'll probably let go three, four people if we quit building houses. And I, that's going to trickle through, on through, and on through the community. That's going to be the supply houses, the multiple supply houses that we deal with, their sales staff. I mean, you know how this runs. It runs right through the whole community. Um, we need it. We, and not only just for the the builders and the, to, to offer those homes for people, we also need it for the citizens themselves. As a citizen, I've taken advantage of special assessments on property. To pay that special assessment back at the, at the rate that, that I can pay that back is lower than the rate that I would have to borrow it from, the rate that would attach to my property, whether that's 30000 20000 at the rate I would borrow the money versus the rate that the special assessment's been able to set. Makes a house unattainable for a lot of people. I think uh, it's a pretty serious matter sitting in front of you, and I think there's a lot of a lot of weight on your shoulders and a lot of responsibility and it's going to come back pretty going to affect a lot of people so i hope that you make a wise choice thank you thanks sir. thanks eric <clears throat> any other public comment i'm greg stevens 842 south 10th I'm a landlord here in town, and uh, I teach out of K-State. I'm not speaking for K-State or anything, but uh, two or three weeks ago, we had a speaker in that talked about population trends, future population trends. And as a follow-up to that, we had people f fill out feedback cards. And one of the things that jumped out from the students that were there is that, and this kind of follows up the previous speaker, is that to attract youth, to attract young families and to retain youth, we're going to have to work on more of a mixed use, more of a downtown development, more parks, more connectivity, and a lot of things that are in the, in the comprehensive plan right now. And uh, uh, this is what these, these young families want. They want to have kind of a, a place where they can congregate and gather. And so I'm, gonna, I'm here to speak in support of uh, looking at cluster development and those kinds of things and looking at the comprehensive plan and if it takes more time to kind of look at these things I think we need to look at the long view 
and not some short reactions because I think there is there are jobs that can be found in redevelopment and uh, allowing some balance in the special use <coughs> policy that you're going to come up with so thank you for your time thank you Greg Uh, David Norland, 608 East Republic. Um, I appreciate the comments made by uh, the, the manager of Summit Plumbing and um, want to echo some of uh, Greg Stevens' remarks as well. Um, we have been fortunate to have a home that was built in the 1950s. And <clears throat> when we moved here, we were all looking at a similarly priced brand new house on Republic Circle, which at that, that time was being developed. We opted for our house built in the 50s because there was um, character and as characters we sort of like a house that matches our personality but also because there was something that could be done with it uh, and there was there was a structure there and a plan that that had a kind of a tradition to it in that process we have uh, talked to several contractors I'm not personally nearly as able with a hammer and saw as some people are and so those contractors have been good and I've had I think good relationships with those folks who have been contractors for us and gotten to talk about some of these issues. One of them mentioned that they had been <coughs> uh, they had gone through a period of time and I think maybe the contracting community that's here may may recognize this uh, when uh, the uh, onslaught of many troops into Fort Riley was occurring there were practically there were few jobs for contractors because everybody was shipping their their employees to Junction City short drive a lot of profit to be made I go by some of those houses as I go toward Manhattan that look like uh, frankly they look kind of ramshackle that's not all you know it was built quickly now that forces are being withdrawn from Fort Riley to some measure some of that housing is now overstock I think the Salina, for one thing, is lucky not to be subject to that kind of boom and bust mentality. I'm glad for the City Commission's approach as a measured and steady uh, to look at a balanced, comprehensive plan that will fit. Uh, and when we look at infill development, I, I know uh, from visiting briefly with Gary Hobby that there is a plan to try to encourage some of the companies here in Salina to work on workforce development that is affordable whether it is new housing that is affordable or older housing that can be rehabilitated and is affordable. And these are the kinds of projects that um, I think deserve a lot of attention. The question, we, get, we have a comprehensive plan and that's excellent and I'm glad that we do. The question is where the rubber meets the road where city money and taxpayer money is invested to push toward that project. I of course, uh, after sitting on the Planning Commission, am very appreciative of uh, contractors, developers, and the dilemmas that they face, and they should not be ignored. But at the same time, I think we need to have a vision that, as Greg Stevens said, is long term, that looks into the future, that does not just immediately jump at the most imme uh, immediate opportunity, uh, whether it's federal money for a Ford or, or something else. So I applaud that, but I hope that the Commission will take the long view and, and look seriously at infill development as well. Thank you. Madam Mayor, Commissioners, thank you for the time to do this. First of all, uh, thank you for, um, you have brought a lot of awareness around the comp plan. Uh, I do appreciate that throughout this whole process. You brought some awareness and you brought some people in here who probably have never been inside or downstairs in this building again to hear that. So some good could come out of this, um, which is kind of interesting. And first of all, I would like to just state that I'm coming not from the, the building community, I'm not coming as a real estate agent from you today, I'm coming as a citizen of Salina who's been here, who loves this town and loves to see the growth that happens and how it takes place and everything that's going on inside here. Everybody that's in this room here, uh, I either know personally or have dealt with them and I think they're just showing up here today to say that we don't know that this is right. We don't know that where we're headed. We know we just came out of a huge recession. We know that we got this built back up. We know that we're moving in the right direction. We know we've got economic development coming to town when they come to town. They look at rooftops. Uh, Dix that comes to town, Marshalls that comes to town, anybody that's looking at is going to look at rooftop and is there activity and viability going on in the residential thing. 
I still don't know what I agree with, with Aaron on does residential pay, but I, I respect city staff, and if they're agreeing with you and say there are studies that say that, I guess I have to believe it, but I still can't believe that an 80-acre farm field sitting out in the middle has less of an impact on the city of Salina that I live in. Uh, if that's the case, why don't we just draw a ring around it and say we're done? Because anything we do from now on is just going to cost us too much money. And I would rather know that now to make a decision whether I want to stay in this community or not. If it's done growing, then that's it. If that's truly the truth of that study, why would we ever grow ever again? Now, the first thing is it's kind of been a little bit of a moving target. So I just want to make some clarification as I leave here today as being in the building community. I, I just want to know what's my next step and, and what is going to be approved and what isn't going to be approved. And, and number one would be when we first got together, uh, the concern was all on defaults. And that was all that I heard. And then later on, there was no concern on defaults. We had proven that back 20 years ago, there were some defaults, but we'd put some mechanisms in place that would take care of those defaults. And I think we've done a pretty good job from there. So we kind of moved on to the next study session. Then it became, well, this is way too easy for developers. I mean, developers are making a ton of money. They're buying up ground and, and using city tax dollars to build new stuff. And the people out north and west are just, just not making it happen. And we, we proved that, that that probably wasn't the truth, that it's not the easiest thing to do. And the reason we have to build in small little things is we don't have Pulte homes here. We have local individual guys signing their name, personal guarantees for half a million dollars to make this community better. I couldn't do that without the bank helping me, without the bank behind me and then the city saying, you know what, we think this is probably pretty good for the community. It just can't happen. And I wish it was, because I would back away if somebody wanted to come in here and put, actually, I'd be scared for my community. Somebody came in here and said they want to put 200 houses in. We can't build 200 houses that fast. We're in the study session, so on. We need about 85 to 88 homes to sustain that. As a real estate agent, what you need to be aware of is when those 88 homes sell, it opens up for our youth to be able to buy and purchase their very first home in town. And if we want to keep our youth in this community, it's through home ownership. Because I can tell you, when I moved to this town, had I not purchased a house at age 20, I was recruited out of here two, three, four times. And if I had rented, I would be long gone, would never be a part of this community. If we don't allow new construction to be going through, it does not allow for people to buy their very first home. That's how the home ownership opens up, is people buying second and third homes that are there. We go into the, the talk of density and sprawling. I don't know about you, but I, I'm, I just, it doesn't make sense to me. I can't drive up any arterial street and see where we've done any type of sprawling. Now, I know some commissioners up here believe that Stone Lake was sprawling or going on the other side, and I beg to differ. The, the sewer and the infrastructure was across the street. To me, that's not sprawling. And maybe that's just my opinion. The density factor, we're not Boulder, Colorado. And they've got their own problems they're going through. We're not Longmont. The truth is, I lived in Denver for my whole life until I moved here at age 19. And I could go back there if I thought that was a better life. But when I moved to Salina, Kansas, what I love is open I love the big backyard. I love the space. You could move to California, and they've got an ocean to look at. And what we have is we have space available. And in Salina, Kansas, people like space. And I can appreciate the other day when we were in the study session, and you said that we're looking for certain amenities. And I was lost. I came to you and said, OK, well, I'll build the big fountains, and I'll put the big entryways in front. And you said, John, that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for bike paths, maybe some trees, some connectivity to parks. And some of that I agree with. But the truth is, I don't really want somebody walking in my backyard and riding their bike. And, and that's okay. And if that's the truth, then let's have somebody die, sign their name on a personal guarantee and say, this is what I think the community wants, is somebody walking in their backyard. And I just don't believe that's the truth. Now, if somebody wants to step forward and build that type of that and it sells, then great for them. But I don't believe that that's what I would want in my community that's there. There's a lot of people behind me who I, I'm not worried about 2013. I'm really not worried about 2014, but in 2015, I do this every day for a living. I put people in my car and I drive them around, I show them the community and try and get them here. And I can tell you, and I won't mention names, but there's a young couple who just opened up a restaurant here in town. And I put them in my car and I drove them around. They said, we want to build a new home. And they said, what's the price? And I said, you better go look on Ritker's. That's the only eight lots that are available. And they decided not to build. They still live here. And I'm not sure what will happen to them. I sold a house to a, a gentleman you guys would all know by the name the other day. And he could have either built in a development with no special assessments or he could have built a brand new home with special assessments. You know what he said to me? Todd, I'll take the house with special assessments. I said, that's really interesting. Why would you do that? He said, the truth is, if I were to build in somewhere else where a lot ha didn't have special assessments, it would cost me $330,000. Or I could buy this house for thirty or for 300000 If I'm trying to get out of PMI, I've got to come up with an additional 20% to get out of PMI. He said, it cost me $6,000 more to finance that house 
to get out of mortgage insurance because I'm not doing those special assessments. We can do everything you're talking about. We can do everything that's there. And whether it's good or bad, only we'll know in 2016. But what I will ask you is, anything that we do that moves forward with the plan that you're putting in place here is going to cost the taxpayer and or the end consumer more money. You can put all those things inside there. And that's, I guess that's OK if that's what we want to do. But for me, getting our prices up to competing with like Hayes, Kansas at 260000 when we're at two hundred twenty, I just don't believe that's where it should be at. So thank you for your time. I, I, the answer, the only thing, the last thing I'll do is, is I appreciate city staff on the resolution that's there. I'm not quite sure just changing one word out of there to will to may is going to answer it. I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I'm not speaking for the development kitty, but I have some concerns about if somebody were to default on large amount. I am concerned with uh, I don't believe that somebody should come in and do special assessments and then not be able to sell to the general public. If it's going to be city finance, I don't believe that the builder should be able to hold on to all the lots. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know how to answer all that stuff, but I think there could be a study session or something put together that would resolve that and uh, come up and say these are criteria. Because the truth is, and this is probably what will happen, is as a developer, the next person who comes in, whoever that may be, God bless them. But when they come in front of you, they're going to spend twenty to $30,000 of engineering and structural. They're going to go through DRT. They're going to go through all the method, they're going to walk in front of you, and my fear is you're still going to say, you know what, guys, we don't want it. So what mechanism can we put in place so that the person up front, before they spend $30,000, knows whether it qualifies for special assessments or not, not we may do it after you spend the money? Any questions? Thank you for your time. Thank you, Todd. <laughs> My name is Kirk Cusick. I live at 2737 East North Street uh, here in Salina. And I think, um, you know, I'm just a taxpayer. Uh, I'm not a developer. Uh, I'm not. But what I've, what I've learned is that you guys are making decisions with my tax dollar. And, and what I'm hearing is I'm hearing people say, that they want this tax money used to help building occur outside of the limits of my city. I mean, that's what I'm hearing is they're asking for assessments for that to occur. As a taxpayer in the city, why would I want that to happen? Why would I want my tax dollar to follow people who aren't building or working in the area that I live in. I don't understand why that would be something that I as a person in this city would want to have happen. And the gentleman who just talked before me who talked about those houses are the ones that are opening up for the young people. So basically what we're saying is for you folks who want a brand new house on the outskirts of town, here it is. We'll help pay for that. But here's the junk that you who want to be on the inside get to live in. I mean, is that, is that the message that we want to send? And I was so excited. I was so excited when we did the comprehensive plan. Because I was part of that whole process from start to finish, going to all of those meetings. And I thought to myself, you know, this city is coming together to really make a difference. They were talking about North Salina, East Salina, South Salina. I mean, they were talking about all of it. And that's when they talked about the bike paths and, and, the, and the parks and, and connecting this all together. It was a beautiful plan. But that plan also talked about investing the time, energy, and money within those boundaries. We can't move away from that plan. That's what people got excited about. It's like we've forgotten that. That's what made people excited was that it seems real. It seems like people are really starting to look at what we can do here in our city, in our city, in my neighborhood. So all of a sudden, I was able to say, now my tax dollar is actually going to be in my neighbor's house. I'll be able to see my tax dollar at work or in the street being redone or the bridge being redone or, or the house is going up in the empty lot there. All right? I was now able to see that because this comprehensive plan put that in front of everybody and said, this is our goal. This is what we're going to do. So all I'm asking here today, follow the comprehensive plan. Follow the comprehensive plan. Get this policy 
so that it supports what you said you were going to do in the first place. Actually, you didn't say it, what the citizens of this community said that we were going to do in the first place. So get your policy in line with your comprehensive plan. It doesn't matter how long it takes, that's what the people asked for. And so that's really what should be done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, my topic, 914 Oak Lane. Um, again, thank you for your time. Uh, I was glad to hear that Todd did pay attention to the study session, so that was good, Todd. <laughs> appreciate that. One of the things that has come out of this study of special assessments is we continue to come back to the, the discussion of the redevelopment of the area of change. And one of the things that we're going to ask is that um, Commissioner Blanchard, you and the city commissioners along with city staff, come up with those tools that we continue to hear about. Because right now, the, the gentlemen sitting behind me, the tools they understand are, are shovels and, and saws and hammers, and really are not sure exactly what tools we're talking about to redevelop um, the area of change. Um, the conception that the builders and the, do not want to go into North Salina, I believe, is, is incorrect. Again, they're willing to go there if there's work to be done and they feel like there's an ability to be profitable in doing that. Um, one of the issues we have is the, the developers we have in this community are developers. They're not redevelopers. And those are two completely different scenarios when you're looking at, at what needs to be done. Um, the gentleman that just spoke talked about, you know, following the comprehensive plan. And again, the comprehensive plan does talk about a balance between change in, in the uh, inner city, and it also talks about redevelopment and about us continuing to, to be contiguous as we move to the south and to the east. Um, one of the concerns that I have as a citizen is if we discontinue the use of special assessments for um, infrastructure is that you could see some developers leapfrogging into the county and we've discussed the uh, the uh, div subdivision that's just uh, out on the other side of Holmes Road and that could create a problem for the city of Salina in the future as we continue to grow east and if we're not careful we could see those type of subdivisions beginning to pop up throughout the county causing us more problems than we currently have in meeting what's uh, in the comprehensive plan again as we did as we talked about in the study session we are currently building the number of homes that are necessary for the growth that Salina has again from 2000 to 2010 we had a little over 2,000 uh, people growth at 2.3 individuals per home we need those 85 homes, as Todd spoke about earlier, to be built to just match the growth that we have. Um, again, as we looked at in that study session, um, depending on how infrastructure is financed, we could see an increase to the end consumer when they buy them that home. So again, there's a lot to think about, and this, de this decision needs to be taken very seriously as to how it's going to affect Salina and its growth and its ability to continue to um, go against other communities for employers and employees in the future. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mike. You, Mike. My name is Bob Hayworth. I live at 913 Twin Oaks Drive, and I'm a developer and builder here in the community. I've actually been a developer since the late 70s in the community, and through the entire time, the majority of the time, uh, the areas that I've developed have been through special assessments. Um, I've developed once uh, some townhomes once that was private streets that wasn't 
financed by special assessments. But other than that, everything that I've developed for all those years have been special assessments. And I know there's a lot of people behind me that have been associated with special assessments either through being a subcontractor, contractor, developer, or whatever, and that's why they're here today, and it's something that we've had for a real long time that's worked ex obviously extremely well uh, because it's worked for so long extremely well. And yes, we did have special assessments once that was 10 years, and then it was changed to 15. Part of the reason for that, the cost of putting streets, sewer, and water in the community has raised dramatically from when it was a 10-year special assessment. And that's why we look towards looking into a 15-year assessment is to try to reduce that amount of, of cost to the homeowner. Another thing with the special assessments, you've heard some people talk about financing, banks, things like that. Yeah, it's going to cost the builder more money, but in the long run, it's going to cost the consumer more money. And there's going to be less money floating around in our community. In other words, that rollover money to where that could be spent in other areas also. So it's not just that house that we have to look at with those specials, but it goes beyond that. Special assessments in an area that I'm developing right now, the paperwork that I hand out, I have what the principal and interest payment is for special assessments every year and when it pays out. It's no surprises. It's there. It's in black and white. The people understand it. They know it. Uh, the, pretty much all the people that I've built for in the last five years, I've asked them questions about specials and stuff. And in my subdivision, I think about half the people were new people into the community that came in and they liked the idea of the special assessments. They wanted it. They thought it, we'd talk about tools. It was a tool that they liked that they wanted to have within the community. And I like the tool of special assessments. And I think it's something that we do need to continue. Uh, the other thing that I did, the subdivision I'm doing now just north of Great Life, uh, which is close to Mariposa subdivision, I tried to put a lot of curved streets in there. I tried to keep a lot of the natural trees in there to where people could plant other trees, eventually take some trees down versus just swiping the land out 100% to try to give it some character in that area. The backyard sidewalks, I even left that options with some of the people that live there. If they like the idea of that, like Mariposa, and I didn't get one homeowner that wanted to have uh, backyard sidewalks for walking paths. They had no interest in it at all. They wanted to continue with just the paths in the front. They liked the natural setting in the area. And once again, they like special assessments. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Joan Ratzliff, Salina. Um, I live kind of in the middle of town, south of downtown. Um, and I've lived here since 96. It seems to me, it's my perception, that the city's footprint is growing faster than our population. Um, I see, you know, and I'm sure I don't have the whole picture, but this is what I see. And it appears to me that the new houses are taking farmland out of production. That's a concern to me, and I think it should be to our population as well. Um, when, um, when that footprint spreads um, away from downtown, and away from the, our um, more historic population center, it leaves that city behind. Um, I see the new houses going in are, um, you know, very fine houses, um, a minimum of $100 a square foot. Um, they are more expensive than the average person can afford. Um, the median working wage um, earner is not going to be able to afford a new house. So um, um, also, um, I'm concerned about the, sp the effects of sprawl by um, spreading our city uh, in those areas, especially with um, residential development because of the expense to me as a taxpayer in town with um, we're going to have to put in fire stations, um, you know, other services are going to have to be extended, um, maintenance of all that infrastructure, and um, I would much rather see our um, 
um, the parts of our city, including where I live, uh, between Republic and Crawford, be um, uh, continually improved and maintained rather than left behind for the new development that is going on. Um, I'm concerned about um, more traffic congestion, more traffic on our roads, um, you know, getting from their from jobs to newer developments that are spread out. And uh, my desire would be to see my city encourage uh, smarter development uh, and redevelopment rather than uh, using our, our tools to encourage sprawl. So, a lot of good comments out here, and I know it's not a simple issue, but that's my wish. Thank, Thank you. you John. Thank you, John. Uh, Kelly Dunn, 3059 Quail Creek Place. Um, I as well, I'm a builder and developer in town here. I've been involved in several subdivisions, most of which have used specials. And I, like everybody else, I don't think we're worried about tomorrow our jobs, but I think a lot of people here are probably worried a year from now, two years from now, what's going to happen. And I think what's going to happen is if we do away with specials, you guys aren't going to see new subdivisions brought to you for approval because they know what, they're not going to get the specials. So how long is it going to take till we can start getting new ones and it takes several years to get something going so I think we're going to end up with a dead spot there somehow that's all I have thank you Thanks, oh, I did want to recommend oh, let the moratorium expire that's would be great for me Thanks, Kelly. James Blackwell 2519 Blakemore thank you for your time Unlike most of these guys out here, I'm not a developer, I'm not a contractor, and I don't even work for most of them. I do remodeling. I have about seven to eight employees at any given time. And I'm going to tell you, if you slow down building in this town, you're not only going to affect the builders, you're going to affect those people that you're so adamant on rebuilding the north end of town for these people. Most of my employees live on the north end of town. You're going to affect them because I'm going to lay some of them off. Because every one of these builders and all of their employees, when you stop their building, I've seen it already once. As soon as the building slows, they step into my line of work. The remodeling becomes the thing of the day. So when they step into my line of work, especially with Mr. Hayworth's name, Bixby's name, I can't compete with those guys. They have a good reputation as builders. They're going to have a good reputation as remodelers. So all the guys that you're trying to help are be going to be the ones that are going to be unemployed first. The ones that work for me. The small guy. I heard each and every one of you during some election at some point say you want to see Salina grow. And I can appreciate your tenacity at sticking with the comprehensive plan. To see Salina grow, you have to support the growth of Salina. This is just one way that you can do that. I heard it out of every one of your mouths. You want to see Salina grow. You want to bring businesses. You want to keep young people in Salina. You cannot do that by stopping growth. That's what you're effectively doing by this moratorium. I'd like to see the moratorium ended or, like we discussed with option B, come up with some guidelines. Let it be known what those guidelines are. Thank you for your time. Thanks, James. Thanks, James. Daryl Bixby, uh, 1519 Briargate. I've uh, built, rebuilt houses in, uh, say, on South 11th and so forth, uh, 4th Street. Uh, I've seen the impact. Uh, your neighbors wonder what, you know, what's going on because their taxes go up next year. Uh, plus the cost of uh, just moving in, well, this is, uh, I've had some rentals and uh, tore one down and rebuilt. The cost of putting it back was, uh, ended up being more expensive because you have to go in, you have to redo the sewer, the water, go into the street. So you got, best, basically you got the, the um, you don't have the specials, but you have to pay for all the, the infrastructure basically uh, to start over. Um, that's just in the, say, going in and, and you got to take that in consideration as far as uh, going somewhere and and uh, you need to have some kind of a plan to do it because it's, it's not basically feasibility just to go grab a house or, uh, you know, 
uh, one area, one little area, so forth. You're going to have to do a major. Um, the uh, I'm, I am a builder, and uh, the specials, yes. Uh, I think one thing that I've got a problem with now is that there's a uh, um, you have to tell everything that's in the house. You have to put out a uh, oh, what do they call it a um, Disclosure, disclosure. Uh, the realtors know this, uh, and if they know their special assessment, which I don't know how many realtors in this town do not know it on new new uh, areas, there is special assessment. So somebody buying that house, if it's not a disclosure, somebody should be in trouble. And anybody that buys my house knows there's uh, special assessments. So uh, I agree. Maybe a few years ago, so forth. Um, a lot of people were getting stuck with not knowing because that was something that was not brought up. And I've ran across that, but like I say, never uh, mind because that's one thing that I make sure they know. Uh, so I think now the way the layout is, folks, uh, so far on the disclosure uh, aspect is if it's not on there, if people don't tell them, I think the buyer has something to come back on. So uh, uh, that part, uh, the legality of that. Um, I think we need, we need to have special assessments. I just, uh, if there's any way you, we can, I don't know, uh, work into a, a down the road, 5, 10, 15 years, you know, looking at something different, uh, like phasing it out. But you're going to have to do something. You can't just shut it off today. So that's all I have. Thanks, Daryl. Uh, my name is Tracy Sin. I'm at three, three four zero and a half South Connecticut. Um, one thing I've noticed is a lot of developers today, and um, I've been driving around all over town and seeing all these lands that have been bought and with the name on it and everything. But the one thing that the lack of is having a model home, building right where you're going to build your home. Um, I would want to know where you got your product from and how, how the house can be made and the home and the products. You know, just the basic necessity that if you're going to buy a land and you want to build a home, you have to have a module home. So that I'm from California. I'm used to that. If you want to buy something, it's right there in front of you. How it was built, made, and everything. Tiles all the way down to the concrete. And that's one thing we're lack of. We don't have a model home. When you want to go buy a home, you see an empty spot. So you don't really know what you're getting into. OK, thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you. Hi, Diana Dirks, realtor, 1221 Sunrise Drive. I just wanted to reiterate on some of the comments that have been made, uh, especially regarding uh, disclosure. Uh, as a realtor, we are obligated to inform our customers and clients of every aspect, any cost that we are aware of, uh, especially when it comes to the uh, point of specials. They are informed as usually in a new construction, the general uh, taxes hadn't been assessed yet, so that'll be the next year, but they do know that there will be special assessments. There was a suggestion that it be reduced from 15 years to 10 years. Oftentimes, that makes a big difference in their decision as to whether or not they're going to be able to afford to purchase a new property, because over 15 years, it does lessen the amount, including with their PITI, of what they have to pay on their payment. So I would say the 15 years would really work better for most of my customers, and it would. Our Chamber of Commerce here, I think we should be very proud of their efforts and what they're doing to uh, encourage manufacturing new businesses to come to Salina. Not all of those individuals are going to be purchasing new homes. A lot of the new um, newlyweds, the new kids on the block as we refer to them as, uh, purchasing their first home. They're going to start working their way up, start out small into a new home. But if we discontinue building those new homes, when it comes time for them to be able to do that, that's their dream, that's their on their bucket list, so to speak, then we're going to have a, a, not an avail, enough availability of those homes. So 
to curtail the opportunities. And these gentlemen, I guess you have some ladies involved in construction, I'm sure, but most of all, the gentlemen, instead of being able to have job creation, you're going to have job elimination. And it's going to take away from the efforts that our chamber is trying to bring jobs to Salina in our area. We're going to be starting to lose our workforce. And a lot of times when companies come to our area, they're looking, first of all, what type of workforce that we have here. So I think this is a big decision that you have to make. And trust me, I know what big decisions and the implications they have with it. but. I would really seriously listen to especially what some of these contractors and realtors are saying because we need that those new homes and don't take the jobs away that we already have. Thank you. Thanks, Diana. Thanks, Diana. My name is William Humphrey. I live at 600 East Elm Street in the old part of town. Uh, as most of you already know, though, I am in the development business along with my partners. And uh, I've listened very carefully and uh, admired your patience. Uh, and it reminded me of many years gone by. I've served a total of 13 years on planning and zoning and et cetera committees. So, so my heart goes out to you. When I moved to Salina, we were uh, allegedly a town of 40-some thousand people 53 years ago. I'm not a native Salina, but almost. We've been talking about becoming a town of 50,000 people all these 53 years, and we haven't made it yet. Now, part of that reason is because somebody skewed the numbers back in years gone by. But we that's water under the bridge. What we need to do now is to, is to face the opportunities and advantages to city growth that would be afforded us if we were able to achieve that level. I didn't make that level. The federal government did. But there are all sorts of monetary advantages that would be most helpful in rebuilding the interior of our city, redoing all of the things that we need done that there just aren't dollars enough for. Let's do what we can in a positive way to help this town grow. And as we consider the, the uh, long-term recommendations of the plan and so forth, let's keep real growth in mind. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, William. Alan Joke, 847 South 9th. Uh, appreciate the uh, desire to, or the attention to the comprehensive plan since we spent a couple hundred thousand dollars doing it. Uh, we actually uh, offered to go with the county and do a joint one, but they wanted to spend 100000 and do their own, which I think we'd done it jointly. It would have made things a little easier now. But uh, be that as it is, <coughs> um, I would frame the issue this way. To achieve our common vision of the comprehensive plan, should we be subsidizing greenfield development, which to me is what specials are. Uh, now. People pay attention to city government when they feel it's doing something that's going to affect them directly, because most people don't pay attention to it very much. But you've got a lot of people here that uh, perceive, for whether rightly or wrongly, that what you do is going to affect their livelihood. Uh, and I can appreciate that. Uh, now, uh, I remember a day about 16 years ago when the room was similarly filled and we were setting up this uh, park fund for neighborhood parks and uh, one after another people came to the microphone and said you're going to shut down home building in Salina if you do this. Um, that passed three to two and I don't think it had any negative effect uh, whatsoever. I'm not sure it had quite the positive effect we wanted either but it certainly didn't hurt. So I would, I would urge you to kind of uh, ignore some of the more outlandish statements you hear. I, uh, there's a lot of remarks prefaced with comments like uh, if you shut down home building in Salina, or if you uh, don't allow people to own homes, or if you slow down building, uh, I don't think you're going to do any of that with your decision today. 
uh, you know, there's communities like Lawrence that are thriving that don't have specials. There's similar communities all around the country. Uh, but I, I would just come back to that issue of do we need to be subsidizing uh, these kind of things? Now, if you do change anything, it's the nature of the beast. People are going to complain because change is, is not comfortable for people. Um, but I would just state from in my opinion, which is just an opinion, uh, if you were to get rid of specials entirely, your macro effect would probably be nil uh, on the economic activity in the community. Uh, there will be some micro effect on some individual builders. Uh, there's probably a few that will go out of business. Uh, the smart ones are already thinking ahead, saying changes might be coming, and uh, let's get ahead of the curve. Uh, but I think I would just urge you to uh, keep, keep in mind whether local government needs to subsidize uh, this kind of activity or whether people can just go to banks. I would argue that uh, you're going to have no effect on the number of new homes built. There will just be appropriate adjustments made. And, um, but I appreciate your attention uh, given to the matter. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thanks, Alan. <clears throat> your Honor and uh, members of the Commission, uh, Dennis Lauber from the Selena. Chamber of Commerce 120 West Ash. The other day are the men and the women that uh, make up our board of directors and they come from some of the larger employers in the community and some of the small owner operated businesses met to talk about our um, 2014 program of work and to identify priorities. The continuing number one issue in this community is and I imagine will continue to be for the near foreseeable future it will be the issue of labor availability. Um, we have made great strides in this community working together even the last 18 months in particular to uh, see some sig significant changes occur in the educational institutions in both in terms of curriculum and in terms of facilities. Uh, significant upgrades funded in part by the private sector at both Salina Area Tech and uh, in USD 305 facilities that came because the business community also saw what they liked in terms of curriculum changes to occur. The debate, or the, not the debate, the discussion the other day amongst our board of directors was that this is good, this is great, we're starting to see people calling us and, and being aware of how those curriculum changes are leading to uh, the, the possibility of finding more labor and they're interested in Salina. The discussion that was brought up, and I wasn't part of that discussion because we broke up into separate groups of our board, was that the issue of, yeah, but I, I can't find a house to live in Salina. I can't find available affordable housing as defined by the people that want to live here. Um, and that is starting to come up again as an issue. Uh, I heard a lot of that six, seven years ago. I stood in this podium numerous times, either planning commission meetings or previous city commissions, and we've talked about that. And I think we made some headway over the last few years at addressing that issue. But it, it, it appears that that's out there starting to show up again a little bit more on the horizon, enough so that the board direction to our staff was to make the continuing issue of available and affordable housing a priority item to try and work on in 2014 because that in, that's one of the solutions for available more available labor in the same way that curriculum and, and facility upgrades are part of that long-term solution. And toward that, what I think we really need is in, in going back to what's in the comprehensive plan where it talks about a balance of greenfield development and redevelopment, really need a comprehensive housing strategy that says what do we do to encourage redevelopment to occur in neighborhoods that are existing in this community now. The communities are 80, 90, 70, whatever years, 50 years old. What do we do to encourage redevelopment to prevent degradation from occurring there? What do we do to, to target and encourage new construction within areas of change? 
and what do we do to encourage quality development to occur outside of the perimeter of the community as it exists today, November 25th of 2013. I think it's a little bit of all of those. I question a little bit if not doing one will automatically lead to the other. I'm not completely convinced that's a true statement, but I think that working together we can come up with a solution that addresses those three very distinct issues that I think everybody wants to see. More redevelopment occur in existing neighborhoods, more new construction in existing neighborhoods, and as the comp plan calls for, a balance that includes appropriate and quality brand new construction. Um, I'll disagree with one of my former board chairs who stood up here uh, with Mike. There's, there's a little bit of a concern that I've got that what will happen, and anecdotally, and my evidence is only anecdotal from what I'm hearing from some of the employers in the community. My concern is not that you'll see um, development leapfrog elsewhere out in the county uh, to, to create the kind of problem that was alluded to down the road of, well, you get another development and 20 years from now that's going to cause a problem. My concern would be that what will happen is that that leapfrog development will occur in Ottawa County or in McPherson County uh, because folks will say I can live there and I'll just do the commute and drive in and obviously I don't think anybody involved wants to see that happen so I think if we work together we have this comprehensive uh, approach Todd mentioned one idea and there are numerous others that are there that are doable John the, the challenge was issued to you to by somebody else to you know identify those tools I think we can all get around the table and identify what some of those tools. I've got a couple ideas in mind that are proven to work to encourage redevelopment, to encourage new construction to occur in existing communities. Let's develop a strategy knowing that that balance that speaks of or is spoken of in the comp plan involves all, th all three of those. So we, we want to work with you in that regard because this, this is an issue that's not going away in terms of uh, long-term labor, labor availability that ties back to economic development. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks, Dennis. Is there any other public comment on this matter? My name is Rodney Brummett. I live at 646 East Iron. I just recently moved into town. Uh, the house I moved into um, was remodeled, and they spent Two hundred and ten thousand dollars remodeling it. Uh, that was in two thousand six. It sold for two hundred forty thousand. Uh, I just bought it for one hundred and sixty-five thousand. The problem is, you forcing all these contractors to go to the north side of town. Um, they put all this money in these houses. These people buy them. Then when they go to resell them, nobody else has done anything. So the price just keeps dropping and keeps dropping. You know, within. You know, I just bought it two thousand thirteen. That was two thousand six. They remodeled it. So there's about $100,000 that was lost. Um, you know, I don't know if you're going to keep forcing the contractors to do that. Maybe if you want people to go to the north end, give them tax breaks or, you know, um, I don't know. I've, I've remodeled a house in town, and it had, like, a tax break for 10 years on it, um, which prorated it or whatever. I think that would be a better deal than forcing contractors to go to the north side of town. Would give them some more incentive to do to do stuff like that. So, thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, Rodney. Is there any other public comment on this matter? Do I have any other questions for staff? Oh, sorry. I'm Pete Earls with Earls Engineering, 115 West Iron. I think there's been a, a lot of misconception between what is assessments and what is your city tax money go for. Uh, obviously, when you do a bond, which is what the assessments go on, it has nothing to do with what your budgeted money is at all. Uh, and uh, the people were speaking about, oh, you can do this, but then that's going to take away from what you're going to do as, uh, as far as a city incentive or city programs for parks or whatever else and that's just not true 
when uh, somebody comes in for a development, you take that and you, go out, you normally go out for a bond. That bond then is paid back by the landowner or developer with interest to the city. And the city basically is just playing the banker. It has nothing to do with your taxes. It has nothing to do with what you spend your taxes on. Nothing. Uh, I think there's some big misconception on what that is. Uh, I'm an engineer, by the way. I own Earl's Engineering. The uh, cost of concrete's gone from $50 to $110 a yard. Asphalt's gone from $25 a ton to $90 a ton. Homes, all the materials going into homes, as well as water, sewer, streets, and drainage have all gone up. Uh, paving, as you know, has gone double. Uh, the real reason why it becomes affordable to do uh, assessments is real simple. It's the price of the home. Trying to get the, the, uh, the builder to be able to, get, to sell the home and the land at a cost-effective manner. We do sub subdivisions all over the state of Kansas. And most places, housing is a big problem. Those cities that don't do assessments also don't have any houses being built because developers cannot afford to go in there and do the development without some kind of incentive. And usually assessments is that incentive. If it isn't happening, unless it's a college town or something like that, it doesn't happen. Uh, you see that all over. Small cities are doing their own development. They have bought the land. And they become the developers because no developer will come into town to build the homes that they want. Same thing. Uh, I think you need to really take a hard look at it's not an either or question. The real truth is you can do both. And you have to do both to grow for a city. Both looking at what you can do as a community to develop in North Salina as well as obviously having new development because new homes are what a lot of people want. I do own a home on Iron Street, 707 West Iron. I remodeled that house. I keep still have it because I can't sell it for what I put into it. I wasn't planning on selling it when I remodeled it. I did it for myself. But the truth is I still own it because I can't sell it. Todd's looked at that house for me and said if I was in some other place, I'd get $50,000 more for the house. But the truth is it's not in another place. And where it's at, no matter how much money I put into that house, it's still worth the same amount because you're not going to get your money back out of that. And that's fine in my case. But in reality, that's where the city has to look at what can they do as a city to encourage and help North Salina, but at the same point not stop the new growth because that's not the answer. You have to look at both. And that's my opinion. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. Thanks. Is there any other comments? Any more questions for staff? I bring it back to commission. <clears throat> Go ahead, John. Maybe just a real quick before we can make a motion in a second and hopefully we can have a little bit of a discussion following that. But just uh, I just want to make a note here that we have three options and I just want to make it pretty clear that option four isn't on here, which I think a lot of people were speaking to in their public comments, and that is remove them all together. So that would be option four, and that one clearly isn't isn't on this list. So I think a lot of the comments that were made kind of alluded to ending development and all that. But uh, having said that, I'm, uh, Madam Mayor, I'm willing to uh, make a motion to approve version B of resolution number 13-7055, which readopts the entire contents of resolution number 89-4066, with the exception of replacing the word will with may and striking section 7, which provides an exception for petitions filed prior to 1989, which no longer is no longer applicable. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve number three in the resolution. All those in favor? I'd like, uh, yeah, we'll go I'd on like some discussion. discussion. I'd like yeah. discussion, please. Commissioner <clears throat> Householder. Go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. 
No, you're, you're fine. Well, I mean, just, just a few things. I mean, just it, – I mean, one thing I was interested that people kept coming up here and talking about the city. I mean, the first half developers don't even live in the city. So they sit here and continue to talk about like they know taxes and everything else. They don't even live here. Todd came up. He, he lives in the county, I think. Um, I paid $15,000 in commercial. But, but you do, but you don't live in the city. Commercial is not our concern. It's residential. I live in the county and I have three properties in the city. I'm but talking now. You guys had your chance to talk. I'm talking. So we're we're going to sit up here. And we're going to discuss the issues that you put up here with really no evidence, and I'm going to discuss back what the actual facts are. You keep talking about density. You keep talking about how the city is not going to grow. You, talk, you, 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 you mention things like the, the default was our concern. That was never my concern that you were going to default on the loan. The plain, simple math is this, and this is for the taxpayers at home. Every new house you build, this is an Aaron Householder study, I would encourage you to find a study that doesn't say this. Every new residential house you build is a debt to the taxpayer. You do not make us money, you cost us money. So to sit here and tell us that the city will only survive if you build more houses is a complete lie. That is not a fact. You cost us money. USDA says about $1.15, anywhere to $1.26. So you can sit out there and say we brought millions of houses, dollars in taxes to the city. You do not. You cost us. Every time you build a new house, this gentleman who lives on North Street, his taxes go up. You're not lowering his taxes. You're raising his taxes. We're not concerned about default. I don't care if you make money. Make billions. Make millions. That's fine. Do it at your own risk. You front the money. If the money's out there to be made, do it at your own risk. Guys kept coming up here. Pete Earl said he talked about his house value going down. Another guy said he bought a $200,000 house for $160,000. Why do you think that is? I'll tell you why that is. Because we make it easy for you to build in the green spaces. Nobody's going to make investments in their property when you don't allow those people's investments to be realized. Of course they're not going to go up in value because you make it easier to build new houses out there. You give a false sense of value because you don't put the specials in the real cost of the house. It's there on the piece of paper. You say it's 200000 but the house is really 230000 And here's the thing. Many of you said in our meetings, if you had to put the specials in there, these were your words, not mine, the house wouldn't appraise. What's that tell you? You're building houses that aren't worth the value that you say they are. And that's a fact. You guys said that. If we put the specials on there, we couldn't get them to appraise. Again, I'm merely bringing up things that you guys brought up. Your false values drive the real estate market down. Real estate market, is, it's, let's face it, it's a subsidy. It's a manipulation of the market. You let the free market decide. And I, I agree with Mr. Jilka. I think some of you will probably go away. Some of you will survive. And that's called competition. That's called fair market. And I'll bet there isn't anybody in here that hasn't complained about government manipulation of the market. Again, pointing back, I was just, I'm sort of going through things that popped up. You kept talking about property value. You keep saying everybody wants new houses. I don't know what this gentleman said and several other people who live in old houses. They're concerned about protecting their property values. You seem to think that those 85 houses that you build a year are the only people concerned about property values. There are 47,000 people in this town. You don't think they're concerned about their property values? You don't think we have an obligation to protect their property values? We have to protect their property values. And if we allow you to keep building out south with city subsidies, that's not going to happen. You're going to be buying these $210,000 for $160,000 or whatever. The comp plan doesn't say it needs a balance in the sense that you're saying. It doesn't say a 50-50 balance. It says we need to plan for future development. It doesn't say that there's a balance like for every fit, you know, you build 100 houses here, we remodel 100 houses. It doesn't say that. And the, and the paragraphs that you guys brought into your study session last week, your week, to give us all the facts, you should have read the paragraph before and the paragraph, af paragraph after it because I don't think you quite understood what the comprehensive plan really says. Oh, you keep, yeah, okay. You keep saying basically... Constantly I keep hearing, you're not going to develop up north. So you need these tools, on and on and on. And, and maybe I agree. Maybe just, just getting rid of specials down south isn't going to necessarily force you into the north area. Chances are you'll probably keep building down south. Nobody's ever said anywhere along the way that we're not going to allow you to keep building. That's your prerogative. Go out and build all you want. 
And the one thing you kept saying is 85, you're, you're building 85 homes according to, and where you got that number was, you said, okay, 200 and some people move in per year. That's 2.3 per household looking at our census. You're building 85 new homes to offset that value. That's assuming several things. It's, 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 that, that number is actually useless. You're assuming that everybody wants a brand new house. And you yourself said brand new houses are only 10% of the houses being sold. So that means we need 8.5 houses, not 85 houses. There are empty houses, so it's not like we're abandoning entire areas of town. You're also assuming every 2.3 or 8, 200 people that move in here can afford. Basically, when's the last time any of you built a house that was less than 140,000? You're assuming everybody that moves in is, is buying a house that's over 140,000. That simply isn't the case. I think our economic numbers say that. I think our income values show that. I think our median home values show that. So to say that we need 85 houses to satisfy every family is, is, is ridiculous. And you keep saying that we need these houses, that, that it's, um, it's been good for the city. The only thing I've noticed is my taxes have gone up on my personal home, my commercial property, and it's not because we're spending $3 million down on downtown lights. That's called, that's called infrastructure maintenance. It's because we keep adding streets. <laughs> hey, this is your community. You, what, you guys would prefer we simply gave you specials instead of fixed up our community, I gather from your laughter. Are you almost done with your comments? You've been, no, you've been, no you've been going on for five minutes, yeah, Aaron. This is fine. your opinion. That's your opinion. Right. We're bringing this back and for a vote. And, and this, this, no, this we're done. No, you're done. You you're done. Is there a way to do that? You I'm gonna, you no, five minutes is plenty of time to yeah, let you, people know you're... Talk longer than five minutes, Mayor. We're doing a job that we were elected to do. That's fine. If you want to cut me off. They can talk all they want. That was your opinion. This is back to a vote. Thank you. Commissioner Blanchard, I believe you had a comment. I think Commissioner Hardy wanted to say something. Well, I, I'm going to make a comment that's less than five minutes, too, by the way. Um, a couple things that uh, I wanted to throw out, too, is that um, I was talking to, um, I'm interested in, in having young people move to Salina to stay in Salina once they finish school. And uh, so I've been polling people about uh, what would make Salina better for them. One young professional I was talking to said, well, you know, it'd be great if the specials on the house were built into the, the house price so that we could amortize them not over 10 or 15 years, but over 30 years. And, uh, and it surprised me that, that they would talk about that rather than talking about, you know, we need more outdoor activities or more outdoor dining or something like that. It was, it was the specials they were, they were talking about, but they wanted to treat them in a different way. And I don't know if there's a way that we could incorporate the specials that way that would make everybody happy. But um, that, was, that was interesting to me. The other thing that has not been mentioned here so far anyway is that uh, one concern of uh, the commission is the uh, bonding capacity uh, that, that we have to look at on a continual basis. Our bond rating has uh, decreased um, in the last couple of years and it's because of the amount of bonding that we have uh, been doing uh, and, and I think I, I'm not sure exactly what percent of it uh, is uh, is um, allotted to the uh, the special assessments I think it's like 15 or 18 percent something like that but anyway it's, it's a, um, a substantial amount of our uh, the money that we borrow ourselves um, that has to go into uh, this special category of, of, uh, of funding and so it's something that it's kind of related to every the things that everybody have been, has been talking about here, uh, but it's, it's an undercurrent that we, we continually have to, uh, to take into consideration. So it's those two things that I'm thinking about um, that, uh, that's important to this issue. I, I'd just like to kind of clarify some of the, what I feel are maybe just misunderstandings about uh, redevelopment. <clears throat> and that is, is that somehow the ideas got in there that First of all, the city would be forcing developers to develop properties in North Salina or wherever. Uh, there's really uh, the the North Broadway uh, corridor and and North Salina were identified as priorities for capital improvement budgets uh, for redevelopment in the comp plan. But however, a big portion of in the infill development and redevelopment really addresses the downtown core, uh, which is basically our, our main core where a lot of our older housing stock is. And so I just want to make, make sure that there's a clarification that uh, when we talk about redevelopment and
and infill, we're talking about the entire area of change which is being addressed. Now only one small section of that area of change is North Salina. Uh, that whole area actually encompasses uh, the area of change a little over four <coughs> of our census blocks and we have ten. So just to take a rough shot of it, a little over 40 percent of our city is what's considered the area of change, which is kind of a politically correct way of saying it's getting pretty run down and we really need to address it and, and bring it up to standard. So uh, a big part of that, though, that's addressed is in the, is in the downtown core area. So, in, so there are specific things that are in that. And uh, within the implementation part of the downtown portion of this comprehensive plan, uh, there, there are a couple of tasks that are, that are particularly uh, useful, and that is, is to, uh, mar it says uh, task DT 7.2 is market downtown to landowners and potential developers for infill and redevelopment opportunities identified in the plan. Immediately following that, 7-3 uh, is to identify and develop <coughs> incentive, an incentive toolbox that provides financial or regulatory benefits when necessary to developers willing to invest in downtown. So I think there are some key terms there. And what I hear a lot of is that there's a forcing, somewhat of a forcing somebody to do something that they're quite frankly not equipped to do. Um, it's never been the intention on my part to try and force anybody. Part of the imp implementation here is when we're charged as elected officials and city staff and, and uh, proper landowners and developers in this plan to go out and market potential developers. That tells me that there's an identification here that perhaps we don't have that expertise here in the city already. So it's not a matter of we're saying do one thing and completely that's outside of your business model or outside of your expertise and try to do it. There is a level of responsibility <coughs> on our part to identify the fact that we don't have perhaps enough local interest in doing any sort of redevelopment that we need to go out and market outside of the city for uh, groups, investors, developers that have that sort of expertise. So we're looking at a whole incentive toolbox here and I think what we're trying to look at, and what I'm trying to address here is the duty that uh, we have as custodians of this plan and the ones that were elected and charged with implementing it. Um, I'm a land planner. Uh, the natural client of a land planner is real estate developers. So I think it would be very hard for anybody here to say that I'm doing anything up here that is in my best special interest, whatever you want to call it. Uh, this is probably, uh, when we speak of conflicts of interest, this is probably a conflict of my interest to uh, try and take on a project that's this difficult and uh, try to help move a process in this city that I believe over the last 40 years has been very reluctant to address a lot of the difficult problems we have and that is, is bringing up our more troubled neighborhoods to a point of overall health and strength that is beneficial for the entire city. So. Uh, having said all of those things, I think that also one thing we need to realize too is that uh, special assessment financing is um, it's not shutting down development. It's basically saying uh, let's give an opportunity, if there exists one, for the free market to work. And, and uh, you know, one of the comments made was that there's no risk to the city that the city is basically acting as the bank. And my question, as, as a member of the governing body, is to say, is it, appro is, it, is it an appropriate role for the city to operate as the bank? Um, I'm sure there are folks in, in you know, we had a, a list of a lot of cities that do special assessments across the state. And, and uh, admittedly, Kansas does an awful lot of special assessments. But that's generally, uh, it's not the majority of other states across the nation. Um, Many, many states don't have them. Many, many states do not offer special assessments for greenfield development. They're strictly uh, designated for uh, purposes such as bringing urban upgrades to rural type 
services within a city's boundaries. Um, we have something over on Cloud Street, up on Otis Street, that would be uh, a way for citizens to come together, form a special uh, benefit district, and allow the city to finance for them. In a lot of cases, that's what special assessments are used for. So I think, I think there's that whole idea of it is it appropriate for the city to use the bank. And as Commissioner uh, Hardy had mentioned before, there, there, uh, we do probably have, and I, I believe it's between 15 and 18 percent of, the, of our uh, citywide debt is in general obligation bonds uh, for special assessments. So um, there, is, there is some risk, and I, and I think to say there is no risk would be to say don't, don't look at Junction City that uh, mm -hmm. had over probably 120 to 140 special assessment lots up for sheriff sale uh, back in July and were, were unable to sell those lots because uh, the special assessments were around the $30,000 range and they couldn't get anybody to buy those because they would be responsible for that $30,000. So um, whereas the risk is not the intent of trying to get this um, process going and, and looking at uh, looking at this process I think that um, you know we do need to be a little bit um, aware that there are risks involved and uh, the actions of incentivizing one type of development over another type of development uh, does have an effect um, I used to uh, are you finished? I'm done. Yeah, okay. thank you. <laughs> I used to work in a department here at the city where um, a lot of people that I saw came in on a daily basis, came in contact with, were very, very poor and lived in very, very poor housing. So there is a lot of poor housing in Salina. And so in that regard, I would like to see a balance. Um, I think we need new housing. We need our builders. We need people to to build new housing for us because otherwise we can't bring people in uh, to new jobs. and. Uh, they need places to live, and people don't want to live in poor housing. But on the other hand, I think we can do some redevelopment, and I'd like to see some ways to incentivize um, some redevelopment. We talked about the old Lee building. We've talked about a lot of things, and, and in North Salina, too, but we just need to uh, reach a balance. And I think this discussion that we've had um, tonight is very, very good, along with the discussion that we've had in the last uh, couple of months about this whole issue. And I hope that we can join together and uh, come together on this issue and, and maybe we'll see some redevelopment, um, some things that will give some, get rid of some of that poor housing and, and get some people into better housing. Thanks. I just really want to, <clears throat> I just want to thank everybody for coming out today and being respectful towards the commission. I appreciate that. I kind of I, I want to apologize on behalf of commission for not always taking the respectful nature that you guys come to us seriously. And I think you guys should always come take as much time as you want when you approach us. Some of you have been here for the last two and a half months coming up to these meetings on this particular issue. And I just want to say I myself appreciate it and I respect you guys for that. So we did have a motion and a second if I can bring that back. Should I re should we remotion it or can we continue, Greg? How should we approach that? No, I think the motion is before you, and motion as and I second. recall, was seconded. So okay. I believe you're prepared to vote if that's your wish. Okay, I had a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Aye. Aye. Motion carries four one. <coughs> Moving on to other business. I would ask that the city, maybe if it's the desire of the commission, to look into hiring a certified economic developer to represent the city. I feel that the Chamber of Commerce does not do a good job doing that. I feel that the Chamber of Commerce is serving two masters. There's been numerous times where Mr. Lavra has come before us with different issues that he has not been on the same page as the city policy, the comprehensive plan, and various other issues that we've had. And I would like to look into the process of perhaps replacing the Chamber of Commerce with someone that we feel like is in the city's best interest. Is there any opportunity to maybe look into what that would take? Certainly, it's uh, certainly subject to the uh, commission's desire. Um, I'd have to, I need to offer that back to the group and see what your interest is. Uh, just a quick update, we have an agreement with them this year. The agreement uh, terminates at the end of this 
uh, calendar year. And so at this time, unless you do something different, our role would be to negotiate a new agreement for the next year. So obviously that would be something different. So uh, I'm, I guess I need your input to see if you would like us to uh, potentially go that course. That would be part of an evaluation process, I would assume, when, when considering whether to renew the contract or how to renew the contract. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it probably depends on what items are important to you and what you'd like to have reported back on and how those relate to whether you would want to renew the interest with the chamber representing our interests or not. Um, there could be an evaluation process. We'd have to think about what, that, what those items would be and probably somewhat in consultation with you because obviously we need to know what's important to you. So we could start with that. Maybe that's the time to do it. That'd be fine. Okay. Any other thoughts? No? Okay. I'm kind of new here, so I really... Um, I, let me just ask a quick question. Maybe it, maybe it was addressed. The evaluation period, was it is prior to the... For the for the contract is prior to the during the budget process and prior to the adoption of the budget. Yeah, the, the contract doesn't provide for a formal evaluation period. What it basically provides for is there's a a certain standard set of services that are provided, um, and for those there's a base fee I believe of eighty five thousand dollars that goes towards that those services. Just general representation, the typical things they do, and then there I believe in this year's contract I believe there are four performance objectives, and each of those has a separate price tag on them, and if you add them all up, I I don't have it from me. It's roughly around $176,000. So in order to get paid for each of those items, those have to be satisfied. And that's something that we're actually have a meeting tomorrow to get an update and see where they're at on those. But it doesn't actually provide that at the end of the contract there's some kind of a formal evaluation. But it's really uh, subject to your discretion, obviously, because it's a, it's a contract between the entities. But the base plus the four performance, uh, the benchmarks or whatever, four performance or whatever, do those provide, uh, is that the kind of opportunity you're looking for? That, that'd be fine. I mean, I just, I just, like I said, I just feel like there's been decisions in the past that I, I, that I think directly fly in, in, in face of direction that has been stated here and in and the, and the overall plan. We, have a, we have, basically have a chamber president who stood up here and said he doesn't agree with the comprehensive plan, and, and, and I don't appreciate that. Yeah. I'm giving him $176,000 a year. I think that's ridiculous. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, let, one thing that I'd like to do is uh, probably today or this evening or tomorrow get with our staff and try to think about how we might want to do that and how we might want to have that conversation with you and, and then uh, see where we go from there. Okay. That works. That's fine. Do we have any other business? Uh, I do have uh, just a little something that I wanted to say. We are just now past uh, November 11th, which was Veterans Day. We didn't talk about that that night, um, but I just want to um, thank some people who are connected with the Quilts of Valor organization, uh, Chapter 809, which is a local organization here in Salina, the Vietnam Vets, um, who presented my husband uh, this past weekend with a Quilt of Valor for his service in Vietnam. And I want to thank the Quilts of Valor Foundation, especially a very special thank you to the local <coughs> Vietnam vets who presented the quilt, Jim De Degen, Jim Deister, Lee and Bonnie ba Axtell, and Jim Cole, who made a very memorial, me memorable presentation uh, to my husband this weekend, and I appreciate that. I hope to work with the uh, group to bring a Quilt of Valor uh, chapter to Salina. The quilt is beautiful. And to thank once again the veterans of Salina for their service and to those women who make the quilts for the Quilt of Valor presentations. Also a special thank you to our local uh, VFW ladies who make lap robes every Christmas. Uh, well, they work on them all year long to, to make uh, for the veterans in nursing homes. Uh, for information on the Quilt of Valor, you can go to uh, QOV Kansas in your search engine uh, and you can bring it up on the computer or you can visit with any of the veterans that I mentioned or, or also to me. I can tell you about it. Thank you. I'd like to quickly thank uh, Mike Frazier and the Public Works staff. Uh, we had our first uh, tricky winter uh, driving day uh, last week. And uh, having driven around town and, 
and uh, on a lot of the collectors and arterials. I thought that you guys did it, your, you and your staff did a great job of, of uh, handling that on the first day out and uh, just wanted to recognize the, the staff over there at Public Works for a great job. And with that, uh, Madam Mayor, I move to recess into executive session for 60 minutes to discuss with legal counsel matters subject to the attorney-client privilege for the reason that public discussion of those matters would waive the privilege and adversely affect the city's interest in the matters and for the purpose of discussing matters pertaining to non-elected city personnel for the reason that public discussion of the matter would violate the privacy rights of the non-elected personnel involved and reconvene at 7 o'clock. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We are now in executive session. Thank you very much. Okay, you guys have a few minutes. Oh, cool. In post. Someone who did not weigh in was the curator. It took Carmen Ramos three years to put together the Smithsonian exhibition, which includes 92 artworks by 72 different artists who have roots throughout Latin America. Ramos agrees the term Latino.